Okay, guys, welcome back. I certainly hope everybody got full. We had plenty of food out there. And um, if you didn't eat some of the bread pudding, I think it's too late because I believe Corey Johnson has finished it off. So, um, Just a few announcements before we move into the keynote speaker for our, our convention. Um, there's been one change on the cocktail reception for tonight at Antoine's. I want to give a special thank you now that I know he's here. Uh, everybody's seen the artwork on front of our convention book. Special thanks to Remy Bullock, um, honoring Ken Sterling. If you weren't aware, uh, you didn't know him very well, but he just didn't like to wear socks. Um, Definite Floridian from that standpoint. Even went to uh, speak in front of Congress, and I think Brian Fitzgerald had to tell him, hey, man, you really need to put on socks. So, um, But Antoine's now, um, thanks to the Louisiana HBPA and all of their organization and putting it together, instead of 530, it's moved from 7 to 9. And Miss Charlotte said, you're going to have plenty of food. So. Don't worry, 7 to 9 will be tonight at Antoine's. Um, everyone are going to get two complimentary drink tickets along with the food. Uh, if you do need to take an elevator, you're going to need to see Miss Charlotte, and we'll point her out. Antoine's is barely two blocks down. We would encourage you to go out the front of the hotel and turn left. Go to Royal Street, which is just next. Take another left, and you're going to walk down to St. Louis, and that's where, that's in the middle of Bourbon uh, and Royal on St. Louis is where you have Antoine. So expect to see everybody there tonight, and it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, Antoine's is the oldest restaurant in Louisiana, and they do an amazing job. So, so we are honored to have our, our keynote speaker today. We are also honored to have a friend and trainer, Breeders' Cup winning trainer, Ian Wilkes here. Uh, I said this morning um, on the Steve Bick Show, I was fortunate enough through a friend of mine, Doug Cawthon, to get, to get in, into uh, Ian's barn when I was pursuing a certain horse for a stallion prospect for Mr. Stronic. And Fort Larne truly became one of my favorite horses. Um, I'm addicted to the speed figures, as some of you know, and he's the only one that ever came close to Ghost Zapper. So my, my faith in him as a stallion, uh, as, from the breeding side, is, it's, I'm still recommending a lot of mares to him. So, uh, but let me first introduce Mr. Ian Wilkes. Good afternoon. I'm Ian Wilkes, and I appreciate being here today and thank Eric for in asking me to introduce Clay Whittem and his family. Clay Whittem co-manages with his mother, Janice Whittem, the racing and breeding operation of Whittem Thoroughbreds. The Whittems keep about 10 broodmares and a similar number of horses in training. They have had success with many top level horses, McCracken, Breeders' Cup winning, Fort Larned, and I've been fortunate enough to train them. And these horses have been instrumental in my career. Clay brings not only insight from managing a small but highly successful breeding operation. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Clay Whittem.
Thank you. Go right ahead. Not the best of starts for Game On Dude. In fact, he's just in mid-pack early. Alpha bounds out of there fast. Fort Larned on the outside is out with speed, and Game On Dude's gonna have to settle behind them with Handsome Mike, Mucho Macho Man going up on the outside, then to honor and serve and Nonios. Brilliant speed is in behind them. Then flat out along the rail, Ron the Greek will play, and Richard's Kid is the trailer as the field makes their way toward that first turn. The opening quarter mile was in 23 and 1 fifth seconds. Fort Larned is on the pace here. Mucho Macho Man is alongside in second. To honor and serve is third. Behind them comes Handsome Mike. Alpha has the rail. And Game On Dude, who we thought might be in front, is not. He is back there in sixth, and he's four lengths off the lead. Then Brilliant Speed. On the outside is Nonios. Two and a half more back to flat out. Ron the Greek, a late runner here, is 12 lengths off the lead. Ahead of pool play and the late back Richards Kid. 46 and 2 for a half mile. A sensible pace. They're not flying, but they're moving right along. Fort Larned continues to lead the way, and now he's by himself. He's got a two length advantage on Mucho Macho Man as the field heads for the far turn. They went three quarters in 110 flat. So the pace continues to be solid. And Game On Dude begins to move now on the outside. He's third and he's three lengths off the lead with Fort Larned and Mucho Macho Man to catch. Handsome Mike has come under a ride. And then comes Nonios. Flat out is in the midst of his rally. He's eight lengths off the lead as they come to the top of the stretch. It is Fort Larned and Mucho Macho Man. And they are now well clear of their competition. Fort Larned comes into the stretch in front. Mucho Macho Man runs at him with one furlong to run. They've left flat out behind. Fort Larned digs in. Mucho Macho Man runs at him. Fort Larned, Mucho Macho Man. Fort Larned with the heart of a champion. Mucho Macho Man was second. A very gallant second indeed. Then came flat out, followed by Ron the Greek. All right, here with Craig Fravel, Tom Lute of the Breeders' Cup, the legend, Tony Bennett. Man, this is cool. Also, the governor, Governor Brown, will be presenting the trophy very shortly, but first we do have a special presentation. Atisa Tajadad of Mont Blanc with a uh, watch to present. Mont Blanc congratulates you on this amazing race. Mont Blanc race must have paid Mont some pretty good fees to get right in the middle there. Congratulations, oh, and you. I hope you'll always remember with this timepiece. Thank you. Governor Brown. What a fabulous race. Glad you were part of it. And what a great horse. Great win. Congratulations. You are welcome. I am going to give this to Clay. <laughs> Janice, 22 years ago, you had a mare that went back to back in the Breeders' Cup by the name of Bayakoa. How does it feel now to own a Breeders' Cup Classic winner? You can tell by the way we all look. Really grand. That's all the voice I have. <laughs> Congratulations on the victory. Tom, Fort Lawrence, and yet another upset on this Breeders' Cup Saturday. That was, that was a lot of fun, and it's always, uh, as you all know, it's good, fun to watch replays. And if you won, you always win in the replay, and if you ran second, you always run second in the replay. So, I want to thank Eric and Leroy for inviting me to uh, speak. Um, I, I, I don't mind talking, so I'll, I'll, it's not a, not a problem for me. And I want to thank Ian for introducing me. You know, and I'm really just going to share with you a little bit about Whittem Thoroughbreds, and, and so that's easy for me to talk about. Uh, first of all, the, you know, our operation, it's really all about people, you know, you know, I understand what people mean when they say it's all about the horse, but really, I think it's all about the people that are all about the horse. Um, our operation, 
Um, it starts with the farm where our mares are boarded and our foals are, are foaled out and raised. And uh, the farm where we send our horses to break them, uh, Lamholm South in Ocala, um, they're, they're an important part of our program. And certainly the uh, trainers that have our horses at the racetrack are an important part of our, of our team. And I, I really do think of it as a team because we do want feedback from people and we want to get their insight as to um, what's going on. I, I want to introduce three of the members of our team. And if, if you would, I, I have to talk, so you have to stand up. Of course, Ian Wilkes, the trainer that introduced me. Grant Forster is a trainer um, that, that also trains some of our horses. Grant's based here at Fairgrounds this winter. And Brian Hernandez, Jr., who rode Fort Larned and rides a lot of our horses. And I, my wife, Elizabeth, I, I want to recognize her as well. I think that for our organization, um, it's important to have some goals for what we're trying to accomplish um, with our with our stable and with our racing operation, and you know to to have to think about having an effective team, I think it's helpful if everybody understands what those goals are and has a, can also adopt those goals. Um, first of all, you know we our goal with our racehorses it is we talk about it it is to win graded stakes races, and where we. Uh, raise the horses, that's important because that creates a lot of value for the families that we have. And, uh, you know, it really, I, I get the same excitement out of winning. That race was exciting, but it's still, when you have a horse running, no matter what the level is, it's pretty exciting when they come around some other horses at the top of the stretch and are going to have a good race. So, you know, we enjoy winning at, at every different level of races, but you know, winning the stakes race is, is what helps create value for our program. You know, another thing that we try to uh, utilize in our organization is for being patient with horses. And whether that's um, developing young horses or once they, even when they go to the racetrack, um, we, everybody that's part of our program is patient and gives horses time to develop and gives them time if they need time off, we give them some time. And where we're raising these horses, you know, the patience also goes to developing brood mares. And sometimes they need time um, to prove what they can do. And so, you know, patience is, is certainly a part of our program as well. And as you, if you read the bio in there, I am a, I, I am a banker as well. So, from the from the business side of things, I think it's important to think about what it takes to have a sustainable operation, whether it's our operation or for your operation as as owners. Um, you know, all of you know that this this is a, a challenging business financially being a, a horse owner and so if you're going to be able to get that really good racehorse that that everybody is looking for you have to be able to stick around long enough to to get a good racehorse and so we think about you know what it takes for our operation to be sustainable and you know j just share with you um, as, as Ian said we, we maintain our broodmare band somewhere around 10 mares. And so in a typical year, if, if we raise seven or eight foals, we, we usually will sell a couple of them at Keeneland. And uh, so maybe if we had seven foals, we might sell two of them and, and put five of them into racing. And I think everybody knows that success at the racetrack really comes and goes. It's it's really variable. And so, you know, winning and, and purse money, it certainly has its ups and downs. And we try to diversify that a little bit 
by having some revenue off of selling horses as well. And so in your operation, maybe it isn't selling some horses, but it's also being a trainer and having some steady income. But I, I think that it's important to have some diversification in your sources of revenue. And it's, it's tough just simply to rely on, on purse money from, from races. Our, our operation, it is a breed to race operation. And so I thought the easiest way for me to, to talk about um, our program is actually to put up the pedigrees on uh, three of the horses that we ran last year. And I've just talked a little bit about their families and where they came from and some of the thinking that goes in um, when we're setting up and raising horses. So hopefully you can read that. Um, th this, so I, I pulled the pedigree on three horses that we ran last year. And the first one was a filly named Walkabout. And all, all of the horses that we run um, today, or all, all of the mares that we have today, come from three different families. And this, if you look at this, the second dam of this filly is Bayacoa. So I know that um, you know, my parents are the, are the folks that started this um, operation and put this broodmare band together. So obviously, Bayacoa was an was a exciting, great racehorse, uh, Hall of Fame. But I'm sure that um, my parents were just as excited and had big plans for her to be the foundation of a broodmare band as uh, what she accomplished on the racetrack. And it's really kind of interesting. Um, Bayacoa had four foals. And out of those foals, only two of them ever made it to the racetrack. And one of them won one race. So I don't know, maybe there's something about uh, leaving it all on the racetrack. But she was a, a great race mare. But as a brood mare, um, you know, she wasn't successful as, as, a, as a dam. But out of, the, out of the two mares that she had that we kept, or the two fillies that, that she had that went into our broodmare band, they have both produced grade one stakes winners. So, you know, in this business, you look at patterns and you think, oh, that must be the trick doing that. So maybe a, a, a really good race mare, the trick is her foals aren't gonna be very good, but maybe the next generation will be, will be pretty good. Uh, let me get my glasses on to see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Um, you know, just sharing our, our approach to things, and it doesn't always um, stay in one particular pattern. But, you know, going back, the, uh, the two mares that we have that were daughters of, of Bayacoa, how they were bred, um, the, the first one is our Lucia, which is the dam of Fort Larned. She's by Broadbrush, and the other mare that um, it, it was retired and, and in our broodmare band was a mare named Trinity Place by Strawberry Road. And I'll just point out, and, and that breeding was, was actually selections that my, that my parents made. But, you know, I think the idea is those are tough racehorses. You know, Broadbrush and Strawberry Road, they both had a lot of starts and they were really good racehorses. They weren't the most fashionable commercial sires, but they're good, tough racehorses. And um, we try to remember that, but it's easy to get excited about the latest two-year-old champion that got retired and forget about the good, tough racehorses. But I think that's important. And walk about, um, if you'll scroll down to the next page. So walk about had 14 starts. She did win a graded stakes race last year, the matron at Churchill Downs. And we retired her at the end of her four-year-old season, and she's a broodmare for us now. But she had 14 starts, uh, four wins, three seconds, and two-thirds. So nine times she was in the money. And she's a, really one of, our, one of my favorite um, broodmare prospects for the future. Walk, that, that's, that's really good. You're going to test my brain cells. Um, <laughs> Walkabout is going to Twirling Candy. 
And so twirling candy is an example of a, a, a type of horse we like to use. Um, he's proven, he's, re he's had a couple of crops, he's had a couple of graded stakes winners, and we kind of like his, we look, we look at these, there's all kinds of information out there and we look at these lists, but for proven horses, we like to look at their graded stakes winning percentage, and he has pretty good numbers. And, and I hope I got that right, remembering which sire she's going to, but, but I think so. Then the uh, second um, pedigree that, that I asked him to put up is another filly, um, Linda. And uh, Linda, if you will go down to the, towards the bottom of that page and look at, um, listen well. So listen well is a secretariat mayor that we bought in 1992. And I think the, our thinking as far as um, buying this mare for a brood mare was that she was by secretariat. And when we think about um, families and brood mare sires, we do like to think about horses that have shown that they are good brood mare sires. And I think secretariat was probably better known as a brood mare sire than anything. So we wanted a secretariat mare. And we bought her at Keeneland and in 1992, as I said. Um, she, she was in full when we bought her and uh, she was in full to a sire that, that I don't know anything about named Night Shift, but that foal that, that she had after we bought her was this, was this filly named Listening that turned out to be a, a, a grade one stakes winner. So the moral there is sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. Uh, the, so that's the second dam of Linda. The first dam of Linda is a mare named Beautiful Noise that we raised. And again, she's by Sonny's Halo. So there's this idea that you don't have to breed to the, to the leading sire or the most fashionable sire, but um, you know he was a good, tough racehorse. He won the Kentucky Derby. And um, this was a really nice mare. And Beautiful Noise was a, was a stakes winner. She's, she had uh, quite a few foals. And uh, this filly, Linda, was her was her best uh, foal by by quite a ways and uh, she's by scat daddy we bred to scat daddy I, w I was just looking at this um, so this filly was bred to him I believe in in his uh, he he had a, had a couple of crops run by then and he was just showing up as a as a really good sire but then after she was bred he really you know, just in the last couple of years, he's really turned out to be a fantastic sire. Um, he, he stood at Ashford, and he's he's no he he died, so he's no longer around. But again, we we like to find horses that are showing they can produce graded stakes winners, and and for our um, going to proven sires, that's what we try to do. We also go to unproven sires. We try to split it about 50-50. So, and I'm I'm the part. So I do enjoy this operation and that I get to work with my mom. And uh, so we, we both have some input into breeding these horses. And she's less excited about bre breeding to brand new unproven sires. And uh, she pushes more for the proven sires. And I inject a few of these young horses in there to breed to as well. Obviously, they can't be proven when they're, when they're brand new. But in true Kentucky, and I'll look at Eric, they haven't proven they can't be sires yet either. And that's what's important. Um, so, I, actually, pointing down towards the, the bottom of this pedigree, there's a, if you will roll over to the next page of this, I was saying that, um, uh, go back up, oh no, right, that's right. Um, we do usually sell a couple of yearlings each year, or some young horses, and, um, you know, when you sell horses, you're going to sell a good one um, every once in a while. We sold the mare, the, as when she was a filly, the uh, filly named Listen Now, that was a uh, filly by Stormbird. So you know that goes back a ways. And we ended up selling her, as I said, we try to sell a few each year to, gen to help with the cash flow from racing. And she turned out to be a, a fantastic broodmare. And 
she's the dam of La Coronel up towards the top that she just ran in the Hillsboro Stakes at Tampa Bay last weekend and she won the uh, QE2 at Keeneland last fall. So we're really proud of, you know, even though we sold the, uh, sold the dam to that, to that filly um, before she ever had any foals, you know, it's, we're still really proud when these families go on and do good things. And uh, I think we'd, we'd love to have her back for a broodmare, but that might be kind of difficult to do at this point. So, you know, that's okay. I, I just, I know that um, when you sell them, they can do well. And if, when you sell them, you hope they do well. Linda, we retired her at the end of last year as well as a four-year-old. And she had 15 starts and uh, won three races, four seconds and five thirds. So she was um, 12 out of 15 in the money. And she also um, jumped up and accomplished what we're trying to accomplish. She won a graded stakes race at Churchill. Um, yeah. The Mrs. Revere, Ian should know that. And Brian as well. So uh, she did, did really well. And last but not least, so I kind of tell you I'm moving along here, is the pedigree for McCracken. And uh, I'll wait for Dennis. There we go. So the family, so I said all of our, our horses come out of three families at this time. The, the third dam of McCracken is a mare named Tuesday Evening by No Double. And uh, my, my parents bought her as a weanling at the Keeneland sale in 1983. And the reason that they selected her for a brood mare is that she was a full sister to a, a stakes winner, a horse named M Double M that Ron McAnally trained. And so they were, they were touted that that was a good horse by a, by a trainer. So, you know, none of that ever happened. Tuesday evening has really been kind of a, a, a bedrock mare of our breeding program. And uh, she's produced some, some good runners, including a, a mare named Madam Pandit that was a sprinter and has been a really good mare in our, in our uh, program. And, uh, so Madam Pandit always had the best looking foals that we raised every year. Everybody's always excited, you know, when you go to look at young horses, well, which one looks the best? And it was always hers, because they were really, they were really, uh, there was a lot of body to them. Scopey, as, as some people would say. So in our program, we do think a lot about the female side of it and focus on the, on the, the broodmare side of it maybe more so than the sire side of it. I think that's just a, an approach that, that we've always taken is to be female focused on our, on our breeding program. And so we really like that mare and we, we really um, you know, thought Seeking the Gold was, was and obviously was a fantastic broodmare sire. So thinking about being patient and focusing on females, you know, we, we took her and took a few of these mares to Seeking the Gold just with the idea of getting a broodmare prospect out of that. And so it takes some time. And uh, we did get this mare, this filly, Ivory Empress, that, that's now a broodmare. And uh, so we got that filly out of Seeking the Gold that we were looking for. And uh, she's the, the mare, Ivory Empress, is now clearly the, 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 big mama of the broodmare band at this point. And she has two foals that have been to race. Um, Bondurant was her first foal and McCracken was her second foal. And McCracken is by Ghost Sapper that uh, I think is an, again, kind of an example of the type of sire we like to use. Um, you know, the, at the time we bred to him, he was actually kind of down a little bit um, in his numbers, but we still, had you know believed that he he had good graded stakes winner numbers and just a fantastic racehorse so again ghost sapper i think fits in that mold of the type of sire that that we like to use mm. mccracken is still in training um and uh we're looking forward to getting him back uh, back going again as a four-year-old and uh he's Ian has him, and uh, he's uh, working back towards a start. 
sometime this spring. Is that general enough? Okay, okay. And so, you know, that's, that's some thoughts or showing you kind of how our breed, breed to race program works. You know, I wanted to just kind of wrap up and mention um, an issue that, that, uh, that I think is important. And, and that's thoroughbred aftercare. And, you know, obviously you're seeing those pedigrees and we've raised some, some really nice graded stakes winners, but you can see that there's a lot of horses in there that aren't graded stakes winners as well. And, you know, it's important to us and I think to the thoroughbred industry as a whole that, um, you know, we are making an effort and doing a good job of taking care of these racehorses after their racing career. And really, I want to point out that all the people that I talked about earlier, from the farm where our horses are raised to where they're broken and the trainers that we use, they all understand that, you know, that, that we want to do the best that we can by these horses and they help us um, when we, if we need to find a second home for these horses, horses that we retire out of our racing program, um, we certainly do want to um, find them a new home um, somewhere where they can continue to, to flourish. And, you know, we, we support the efforts of the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance and the other individuals and industry groups that are working in this area and just want to recognize them and, 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 and provide some some uh, support, support from that standpoint. And from the idea of having a sustainable operation, I think for the industry, you know, thoroughbred aftercare is certainly part of that um, equation to having a sustainable industry as well. So uh, again, thank you for having me be as your speaker. I, I love the, uh, the uh, horsemen helping horsemen, uh, which is the HBPA's core mission statement and goals and I want to um, commend all of you for being part of that and uh, horsemen helping horsemen sounds like a good idea to me thank you